um, shared between the Australian Institute of Physics and the various ASC Centers for Excellence. Um, I'll be moderating the session today. My name is Dave Cordy I'm from the ASC Center for Excellence Fleet and also from the University of Wollongong. Uh, it's really great to see so many people dialing in uh, from so far away. In my case, I'm dialing in from much closer. I'm dialing in from Wollongong, which is Darawal country. In fact, the word Wollongong is a Darawal word, meaning the five islands. And the Darawal were the first in this region to share their stories of their science. So to any Darawal dialing in today, I extend my particular respect, as well as those to the original elders who were the Wollongong's first scientists. Uh, so today's talk is coming from ARC Centre Fleet. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, uh, Fleet stands uh, for Future Low Energy Energy Electronics Technologies. And uh, the goal of the center is um, to find new physical principles and new materials uh, to enable energy efficient forms of electronics with a view towards classical computation. And our speaker today uh, from, with, from within Fleet is Dr. Kira Lee Rule. Uh, her day job is at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization or ANSTO for short. Uh, Kerry Lee is the principal instrument scientist at ANSTO for the thermal triple axis spectrometer and uh, she's also a partner investigator within Fleet and the National Secretary of the AIP. And so today Kerry Lee is going to provide some introduction into the neutron scattering facilities for physics research at ANSTO and discuss the overlap with many, many different people. Hopefully this is broadly relevant to lots of other people working in many fields across condensed matter physics. Uh, just a few words of introduction. Kira Lee obtained a PhD from Monash in 2004. Uh, she then spent eight years uh, working overseas in Canada at McMaster and also at Helmholtz Center in Berlin. Uh, she's published over 80 peer review articles, including over 10 in physical review letters, which is a great innings by any account. And uh, on a personal note, anyone who's ever been lucky enough to work with Kira Lee on an experiment will know that she's a really committed and talented scientist, and it's really not uncommon to get emails from her early on Saturday morning or late on Sunday afternoon containing the latest data from her instrument. So one always wonders when she has time to work. So just before I hand over to Kira Lee, um, we're going to have a question and answer time at the end. We're going to use the chat window uh, for, um, uh, for the talk. And... Uh, we'll read those questions out at the end. So feel free to raise your questions at any stage. So thanks for being here, Kirili, and uh, over to you. Thanks, David, and thanks very much uh, to Fleet and AIP for organizing this seminar. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to give this first of a series of webinars. So uh, as David mentioned, um, the Fleet mission is to try and address energy challenges um, that we're currently facing in terms of the amount of energy that we're using for information technology and, and computing. So at the moment, we know that we're using around about 8% of the electricity use on Earth just to power our, um, our smart devices, our phones, our computers, um, all of this information technology and computing. Um, and we know that this figure is doubling every 10 years. Um, and this is partly due to increase in demand um, and, and resources of, of you know, smartphones and things like this. However, we know that our, our current technologies, which are based on, on silicon um, semiconductors, um, are going to become less, uh, uh, stop becoming more efficient, essentially. They're, they're reaching their limit in terms of their efficiency and in terms of minimization. So according to, to Gordon Moore here, Moore's law is coming to an end. So we need to find new technologies, new materials, new devices um, that will address this energy challenge. And this is exactly where Fleet is going to come to the So. As David also mentioned just a second ago, the FLEET um, is an acronym that stands for the Future Low Energy Electronic Technologies. And in FLEET, we have three research themes and two uh, device uh, technology themes. So in the first theme, topological materials, um, this is dealing primarily with topological insulators. Now, topological insulators are materials uh, where the bulk state is, um, is insulating. And yet the surface states around the edges, we can get current flow in one direction. Um, and this is with minimal loss of energy, so minimal resistance in these topological insulator materials. And as, a, as an analog, we can look at magnetic topological materials, which also show similar um, edge states of, of magnetism. The next research theme is looking a little bit at um, excitons and superfluids. So these are um, 
trying to achieve electrical current flow with minimal dissipation of energy. So we, we don't want to waste our energy with these materials. So these are looking at um, collective states of matter um, and, and how they will operate at room temperature. Um, research in this theme so far is uh, focused on looking at ultra cold atoms um, and also looking at exciton polariton um, excitations um, in semiconductor micro cavities. The next research theme is looking at light transport materials. Now, this is where uh, an intense beam of light can be focused onto your sample. Um, and in doing so, you can change the properties of this material. You can um, enhance certain characteristics. Um, and the main goal of this research theme is to understand the mechanism behind what's going on with these light uh, induced transformations. Um, and also looking at switching, how quickly we can switch between um, the different states in our material. Now, atomically thin materials um, is another sort of theme looking at how we can start implementing uh, device, uh, Im implementing this technology into devices. Um, so since 2004, when, when graphene was cleaved using simple scotch tape methods, um, there's been a real push through the condensed matter physics community to, to try and investigate these um, thinner and thinner down to atomically thin layered materials and to understand their properties just like graphene. Um, now, with atomically thin materials, this also indicates um, uh, materials such as nanoparticles and also looking at uh, thin films. Um, again, as we look at the magnetic analogues of these atomically thin materials, we want to see if we can um, get long range magnetic order in these very ultra thin materials. So this is quite exciting. Um, and finally, in the technology sector, uh, we're looking at nano device fabrication. So looking at ways we can start implementing um, the research that we've done in all these other themes um, and bringing that into devices such as electrical gates, topological transistors, and sensing devices. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the capabilities that we have at ANSTO, what sort of neutron scattering facility we have. Um, in particular, I'd like to highlight some of the, the properties of neutrons that make them a really important tool for condensed matter investigation, in particular for the fleet research. Um, I'll outline a few of the different neutron scattering techniques that we have and highlight these using some fleet type examples. Um, I have a couple of fleet examples from uh, fleet scientists in there too. So um, yeah, hopefully that will explain just how important neutrons are. So where do we get our neutrons from? Um, Anstow's Lucas Heights campus is located around 30 kilometers south of Sydney. Um, it's been hosting a nuclear reactor on this site since 1958. Um, first with the HIFA reactor and now with the Opal reactor, which has been in operation since 2006. And so also operates the Australian synchrotron, which is located in Melbourne, about a thousand kilometers south of this Lucas Heights uh, reactor facility. So here we have a, a really nice view into the Opal reactor. So OPAL is an acronym and it, it stands for the Open Pool Australian Light Water Reactor. And so what we're looking at now is we're looking right down through the swimming pool into the core of our reactor. And this square that you can see right in the middle here, um, which is about the size of a, a standard household washing machine, this is the core of our reactor. This is where our uranium fuel is kept. And you can see we have a lot of different pots um, and vessels around our uh, core of our reactor where we can insert things for um, the multi-purposes of our reactor. So one of the um, very important roles of our reactor um, is to produce medical radioisotopes, such as technetium-99. Now these can be used for uh, diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And so you can understand there's a, a very important um, significance to, to um, making these radioisotopes at ANSTO for the wider Australian community. We also perform neutron activation analysis. So this is looking at um, elemental analysis down to the parts per billion uh, level, where we can really do trace element uh, analysis, find out exactly what's in a material. We also do silicon irradiation, which is like a transmutation process. So by putting these silicon ingots, pure silicon ingots, sometimes up to 20 centimeters in diameter, into some of these uh, ports in the reactor, we can then um, change some of the silicon ions into um, phosphorus. Now this reduces the resistivity um, and makes it a better conducting material. And finally, we also do scientific research. And that's exactly what I'd like to talk to you about today. The scientific research that's carried out by the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering. 
So the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering operate 15 different neutron scattering instruments. And you can see them laid out here relative to our opal reactor, which is located here. And they're colour coordinated by the types of scattering and the types of um, uh, data that they collect. So the ACNS is staffed by around 80 people, um, including scientists, technical staff and administrators. Um, we operate these instruments for up to 300 days a year, um, which means that we can operate around 450 experiments per year on this suite of 15 instruments. Um, typical experimental times can last from anywhere between one day to two weeks. Now that depends uh, greatly on the types of measurements you're trying to take, but it really varies. So what techniques are right for me? What should I be doing? So at ACNS, we host five different suites of instruments and they cover the, the techniques of diffraction, investigating large scale structures using small angle neutron scattering or SANS. Um, they look at reflection and layered materials in our reflectometry group. We also do inelastic neutron scattering, and this is where I sit. I sit in the inelastic neutron scattering group. And we also do strain and um, imaging, strain scanning and imaging. I'm not going to talk very much about that last one, but the first four are definitely very valid for fleet type research. So of course we have these different techniques and they're fit for the different purposes. I also want to highlight that we have the ability to polarize neutrons. Polarized neutrons are very important because we can get extra information, particularly about magnetic materials if we have polarized neutrons. So let's compare neutrons to some other techniques that you might be familiar with. If we have a look at these length scales, you can see that there's a significant overlap in between the types of length scales that each of these different techniques can measure. So why would we choose neutron scattering over another technique? Well, neutrons have a variety of properties, which I've listed here on the right, um, and I'll discuss in a minute. But the other reason why we might choose neutron scattering is if we open up this phase diagram to now look at energy or time domains. So if we're now looking at different energy scales, you can really see that inelastic neutron scattering in particular um, occupies this large area in this phase diagram that's really not uh, covered by any other technique. There's not a lot of overlap. So um, particularly for inelastic scattering, we can see a lot of the very um, small energy changes and, and low energy excitations in our materials. So some of the properties that are um, important uh, are listed here on the right. One thing to note is that because neutrons have a mass, and it's quite a significant mass compared to some of the other techniques that are listed on the left there, because they have this strong mass, then they're, they're very strongly interacting. They're also highly penetrating. Neutrons will interact primarily with the nucleus of an atom. And so they, they ignore the electrons mostly. So as the neutrons are coming in, they see a lot of empty space as they're looking for a nucleus to, to interact with. So they're highly penetrating. And this is, this point here is going to become quite um, important in a couple of slides. But the property that I think is really uh, kind of neat for neutrons and, and really sets neutrons out from a lot of these other techniques is the magnetic moment. So our neutron has a little spin. This spin acts a little bit like a bar magnet. So a north-south bar magnet. Now, when we bring this north-south bar magnet close to a material that has magnetic atoms in them, um, it interacts differently with these magnetic atoms. And so then we can get some magnetic scattering. And so neutron scattering really is a direct probe of the magnetic interactions and correlations in our material. So it can tell us a lot about what's going on in magnetic materials. So neutrons are actually complementary to x-rays. Why are you going to come and use uh, ANSTOS facilities when you might have a lab-based x-ray source at your university? X-rays scatter mostly from the uh, electron cloud around your atom. And so as we move through the periodic table, you can see that as the electrons become more and more, uh, the scattering from the x-rays uh, also becomes more and more. Now this means that x-rays have difficulties uh, observing scattering from some of the lighter elements like hydrogen and oxygen. In particular, when they're in the same material as some of the heavier elements like barium, as you can see here. Neutrons, on the other hand, have quite a random array of neutron scattering length. So um, they're very well tuned to viewing some of these lighter elements like oxygen and hydrogen, especially if they're in the presence of barium, which has a scattering length right down here for neutrons. The other nice thing is when we look at the periodic table, the X-rays neighboring atoms like manganese and iron will look very similar. Whereas uh, for neutrons, 
the manganese and the iron have very different scattering lengths. And so we can see a real difference between the manganese and the iron when we're looking at, at neutron scattering. The other nice thing is that neutrons will scatter differently from different isotopes of the same element. So this becomes quite important when we're looking at um, contrast variation in, for example, deuterium and hydrogen. They will scatter the neutrons very differently. Um, and so we can really um, take, uh, take hold of that and, and really take that to our benefit. So I mentioned before that neutrons are highly penetrating. And one of the really, um, really great things that we can do is use this to our advantage and employ large pieces of sample environment. So we can perturb our sample, we can put our sample into a, an environment and, and change that environment to see how our sample will react and behave. Um, so we have around 17 cryo furnaces and cryostats. So we can reach temperatures down to 40 millikelvin, and you can see here this nice gold beast in the middle is our new Triton dilution cryostat, getting down to around 40 millikelvin. And we can get up to around 1600 degrees Celsius. We've also got a variety of magnets that can apply fields either vertically or horizontally. Um, we can apply pressure to our sample. Oh, sorry, go back. We can apply pressure to our sample, um, electric field. And what's, what's really nice here is that we can in fact apply electric field, magnetic field and temperature at the same time in situ to our sample. So we can really probe regions of the phase diagram of our, of our uh, materials fully in situ at the same time as we're taking our neutron scattering measurements. So I like to think that neutrons are pretty perfect, but um, they do have their limitations. Neutron sources are typically weaker than, than, than X-ray sources or, or other methods. Um, and so often we need to count a lot longer than, than you might, for example, at the synchrotron. Um, neutron sources are quite competitive. Because it's a large scale facility, um, scientists need to submit their peer review uh, proposals um, for, to apply for beam time. And that can be quite competitive. Only the really top notch science um, will get the beam time. The other setback, I think, is that some elements are quite absorbing. So um, samples like uh, cadmium, boron, and gadolinium can absorb neutrons, uh, which makes them very difficult for us to see. Although on the flip side, um, most of these elements will have an isotope that you can enrich that uh, is less absorbing for the neutrons if you need that in your sample. And finally, um, there are often kinematic restrictions. So we can't necessarily access all of um, energy and momentum space that we would like to. Um, but these are our limitations. So let me talk a little bit about our diffraction sweep. Our diffraction sweep here, we have um, echidna and wombat. Uh, echidna is our high resolution diffractometer and wombat's high intensity. And they tend to do a lot of powder type diffraction measurements. And you can see with their open design that they're able to accommodate um, lots of different pieces of sample environment. On Wombat, you can see installed the 12 Tesla vertical field magnet, which is rather a large piece of kit. On Echidna, you can see that we've got um, a 1600 degree Celsius furnace installed. And right next to it there, we have our little robot. So Echidna accepts mail-in samples. You can mail your powder samples to us and we'll let our robot uh, run the measurements for us overnight. We also have uh, a single crystal alignment facility, Joey. Um, and a lovely um, single crystal Lowy diffractometer koala, which can uh, measure samples uh, as low as 0 0.06 millimeter cubed. So this is of the order of um, a milligram or so, or um, similar to the size of the head of a pin. So neutron diffraction um, works like many other types of diffraction from our research reactor. We get a neutron beam, which is um, sent towards what we call a monochromator. A monochromator selects one wavelength or one energy to direct at our sample. Now, crystalline sample, as you can see shown here, is a periodic arrangement of atoms. And these atoms make planes in what we call reciprocal space. And our neutrons will then reflect off these planes into a detector. Similar to the way that a flashlight might reflect off a mirror surface, if you have a mirror. Again, with the neutron scattering, the neutrons are interacting with the nucleus. So, so that's how we get our nucleus scattering. Magnetic scattering happens a little differently, is looking at dipole interactions with the unpaired electrons around the, um, around the nucleus. So here's a nice example actually that's used Wombat um, and it's looking at light induced transitions. So here they've had a look at Prussian blue nanoparticles. 
and they're able to show with their neutron diffraction that um, there are two magnetic transitions in this material. As you cool below 72 Kelvin, the coating starts to order in ferromagnetically. So it's the nickel and the chromium in this coating that starts to order. When you get below 10 Kelvin, suddenly in the core or the center of this nanoparticle, um, the cobalt and the iron start to order quite weakly. But what was really quite interesting is that they were able to um, shine quite a strong UV light source at their nanoparticles. And they were able to show that they could excite um, or enhance the magnetic properties of this material. So this plot directly here um, shows the intensity when the light was uh, shining on the sample, subtracting the intensity when there was no light shining on the sample. So what we're looking at here are features that are just present or just induced by this light. So in this way, um, they've been able to induce um, uh, enhanced magnetic moments um, in, this, in this material. Um, and they've sort of been able to show that there's a charge transfer happening between the iron and the cobalt that's triggered by this light irradiation. So this is a really neat way of showing how we can transform the lights, um, uh, transform materials with light. So another suite of instruments we have is the small angle neutron scattering suite. So these three instruments cover length scales over four decades. So from one millimeter down to 10 microns. So it's looking at quite long length scales, not really atomic length scales, but long, long scales. Um, and the way we can get small angle neutron scattering is if we have a look at Quokka here, the sample is located way up the back here. And our detector is located in this evacuated uh, chamber, in this evacuated chamber. So as the neutrons have interacted with the sample, they start to diverge. And the further away you can put your uh, detector, the better resolution you will get at this very small angles. And so here's a nice um, example looking at a candidate wild semi-metal. This is cerium alum aluminium germanium. So they started off by doing some powder diffraction, which is really nice. And they were able to show that they had some incommensurate magnetic structures. So structures that didn't fit with the atomic lattice spacings. Um, in fact, they were much bigger. Uh, they indicated a periodicity in the magnetism that was much bigger. And in fact, from this um, incommensurate structure, they decided, well, we'll have a look at it with small angle neutron scattering. So with a, with a 30 milligram single crystal, they were able to show that they could get very small angle splitting of their spots. And um, with this, they were able to uh, indicate that it's likely they had meron anti meron um, uh, magnetic vortices in their in their um, in their sample, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner, sort of the magnetic moment structures from these meron anti meron vortices. Um, what was really nice from this experiment is they were able to show that by changing the temperature and the magnetic field very slightly, they could drastically change the way these um, large vortices. Um, of magnetic moments uh, behaved. So they could really change um, the different uh, magnetic structures in this material. So um, in this case, large spin orbit coupling in these semi-metals um, can promote sort of a spin transfer torque, um, enabling energy efficient means of, of manipulating um, the topological magnetism using these um, electric currents or, or by changing the magnetic field. So the inelastic neutron suite, this is the suite of instruments that, that I work a lot on. They, they cover um, quite a range of energy transfers and energy resolutions. If we start up here at EMU, um, on the right-hand side, I know we're working backwards, um, EMU is a backscattering uh, instrument, um, which has very, very high resolution energy transfer. So this is great for looking at, at quasi-elastic type scattering. So this is scattering um, of, for instance, diffusion processes, how something might diffuse through a sample. Then um, we have two cold neutron instruments, the Pelican, the Time of Flight, and Seeker, the triple axis spectrometer. And then we move into Taipan, which is a thermal spectrometer, um, hosting two different secondary spectrometers, a triple axis and a beryllium filter. And this can reach energy transfers up to 200 milli electron volts. And that's equivalent to around 1600 wavelengths. So you can see with this inelastic suite that we're covering a whole range of energy uh, uh, ranges and resolutions. So what is inelastic scattering? So if we look at this um, plot on the right, or on the left here, um, this is showing us elastic scattering. This is when we look at the position of the atoms 
and they show a periodic display, uh, a periodic arrangement. And our neutron scattering profile, this S of Q and omega that you can see below it, um, will show us quite sharp peaks in reciprocal space. Um, and these are what we call Bragg peaks. And they tell us a lot about the uh, periodic arrangement of the atoms in the material. However, with a bit of um, thermal energy, these atoms don't tend to sit still. In fact, they are often vibrating or oscillating around an equilibrium position. And in fact, um, this is what we are probing when we're looking at inelastic neutron scattering. So if these atoms are, are oscillating around an equilibrium position, they have a sinusoidal or periodic um, oscillation that you can sort of see through our S of Q and omega plot at the, uh, just below this, this right-hand red plot um, that shows this periodic uh, dispersion surfaces that can tell us about how our atoms are oscillating and vibrating with respect to each other. So we can understand this in terms of what the, the neutron energy is doing. So for elastic scattering, the neutrons come in with a certain energy and they come out with the exact same energy. This is an elastic scattering process. For inelastic, the neutrons can either gain or lose energy. So when they gain energy, what's happening is the neutron is coming in, it is stopping a vibration or an or a, um, excitation in our material, and it comes off with that discrete amount of energy. The energy that it has gained from the sample, it then comes out with, and we can measure that change in energy. Similarly for energy loss, this time the neutron will come in, interact with the sample and excite it, start it oscillating, start it vibrating. Um, and so when the neutron does scatter, we know that it's lost some energy due to this inelastic process. So the first material I'd like to talk a little bit about is iron thiophosphate. Um, it's a material close to my heart, uh, mostly because I worked on this during my PhD at Monash University. But it's actually become um, quite relevant to fleet research and topological materials. Um, in particular, since 2016, when they've been able to cleave uh, monolayers um, and bilayers of this material similar to graphene. So iron thiophosphate is an antiferromagnetic van der Waals magnet. So what that means is that in the uh, plane, in the AB plane, uh, we have very strong interactions. But between these planes, the interactions are very, very weak. And so um, both nuclear interactions and magnetic interactions. So this means that we can easily make it into a very, very thin, atomically thin material. Um, it is a two-dimensional um, honeycomb lattice. And um, you can see the magnetic structure as determined by neutron scattering on the left there. Um, while it's very exciting that, that we can cleave very thin layers, um, this neutron scattering work that was also conducted in 2016 was looking more at bulk samples. So what you can see here right in the middle is some beautiful time of flight data, actually, looking at these single crystals um, and the, the, the strong dispersion that we can see in this periodic dispersion that we can see when we look inside this AB plane. You can also see from this that there's a lot of overlapping um, excitations here. And this is because uh, a lot of the single crystals are twinned. Now this honeycomb lattice, it looks like a hexagon. So when this sample grows, it can grow with 60 degree rotations or twins. And so that's how we can start, start to get this um, non-single crystal like behavior and overlapping dispersion surfaces. So um, we brought this material to ANSTO. Um, we were able to identify a couple of samples that were exactly single crystal without twins and have a look at the dispersion out of the plane. What was happening out of the plane? And we were able to, to model this with a Hamiltonian and come up with a, a set of exchange interactions. And we showed that within the plane, the exchange interactions are, are relatively strong, but out of the plane, um, it's orders of magnitude weaker. And this helps us to understand the material um, and how when we cleave it, we can actually maintain long range magnetic order even in an atomically thick layer. Now, this is a pretty incredible thing. People didn't think that this would be able to happen, but um, certainly it's been shown um, uh, sort of in the last few years, um, that in these uh, van der Waals magnets, we, we can maintain a long range magnetic order, even at the atomic uh, layering. The next example is, is also a similar example. Again, a magnetic graphene like honeycomb lattice, but in this case, um, they're looking at uh, a ferromagnet. So this time, all the magnetic moments are facing in the same direction. Um, and from this, they're able to, again, use inelastic neutron scattering in the bulk material um, to try and have a look at the, the dispersion and 
um, how the shape of the dispersion in this material. And they were able to show um, in the scans on the left here, you can see that um, at these low energies, we have some almost linear acoustic modes coming out of the gamma point or, or um, the center of the Brillouin zone. Um, they were able to show that there was a, a significant spin gap in this material. And then we started to get some quite parabolic dispersions at higher energies. And it's the combination of this, this spin gap and this parabolic dispersions that indicated that the magnons at the Dirac point um, would have a, an, a finite effective mass. Um, and so this really pointed to a strong, uh, that the anisotropy in this material played a strong role in, in how it was ordered and how when we cleave it down to a monolayer, we can maintain this ferromagnetic uh, property. And in fact, just recently, the same group came, you can see in April 2020, it was only published just last month. Um, they came to, to follow up this experiment using, using ANSO facilities. Um, and they were able to show that they could collapse this gap, this gap that was sitting at about 16 MeV or 12 MeV. They were able to collapse this um, very quickly in temperature, showing a, an almost first order transition. Um, and so what this was highlighting was that um, the easing anisotropy in this material, the, the anisotropy where the moments like to all point in the same direction, um, that this was responsible for the long range magnetic order rather than an exchange interaction in the materials. So um, it, it's like saying that they can have topological transport there. Um, it's possible to have edge modes in this material um, due to um, this, this first order um, transition coming from the anisotropy in the material. So yeah, this, this weekly first order transition is controlled actually in this material by, by strong spin orbit coupling. So moving on to another material that I've worked uh, on a little bit um, is, is linearite. Now linearite is a low dimensional quantum magnet. Now in the previous two examples, we were showing how we could reduce the magnetic dimensionality by cleaving thinner and thinner layers, really um, isolating layers by themselves. Now in materials like, like this one here, um, even in the bulk material, the magnetic correlations and the magnetic interactions are quite isolated. So in this material, we have, we have chains of, of copper ions which interact with each other, but are separated from the other chains. And so we can see that with, with linearite, we can get quite um, an interesting magnetic ground state and applied magnetic field phase diagram. So what's happening here, um, this, this phase diagram on the left shows that when we apply magnetic fields up to 10 Tesla, temperatures all the way down to uh, millikelvin range, we can have quite an exotic phase diagram of different phases. And with, with inelastic neutron scattering in the black here, um, we've been able to show the dispersion at very, very low energy transfer. So we're looking here at around one milli electron volt or less. And by taking linear spin wave theory calculations on the right, um, we can then deduce exactly how much these uh, uh, magnetic spins are interacting with each other. In fact, we've also very recently started to look at the same spot with the red star in the phase diagram, look at using inelastic neutron scattering to reveal um, further interactions. And in fact, from this result, we've been able to show that whereas in the ground state, um, there was no JA component to the magnetic exchange interactions, suddenly as we apply a magnetic field, we, we get this JA component, which becomes quite significant. Again, another, another nice low dimensional quantum magnet example um, is this outer carmine. So instead of being a nice chain, this time we're, we've got um, a plane of, of copper ions. So again, it's almost like a two dimensional magnet again. Um, in, in this sort of material, we have um, a Kagame plane. Kagame plane is made up of triangles and triangles are a really nice geometry to host frustration in magnetic materials. So we get these um, competing interactions as this wants to be an antiferromagnet on a triangular lattice. Um, and again, with inelastic neutron scattering, again, low energy as well, you can see here. Um, we've been able to reveal some quite dispersive modes that propagate along the crystallographic H direction. Um, I said it was a two-dimensional material and our neutrons have been able to prove that. The fact that we're seeing stripes in this nice middle plot right here um, indicates strongly that it is a two-dimensional system and it's, it's, it's really working just in the plane. Um, 
we've also been able to use neutron scattering. I really want to show this, this phase diagram because we've been able to show neutron scattering all the way up to 26 Tesla um, to try and define the outer boundaries of our, our phase diagram. So relative to the, um, to the linearite I showed before, which had a, a um, magnetic phase diagram up to 10 Tesla, this one we're going up to much higher fields. Um, and again, from this data, we can, we can start to extract exchange interactions. Now, one of the really neat things, how does this relate to, to fleet? Um, a recent paper has actually just shown that um, they've been able to intercalate um, adacarmide into graphene. So by doing so, they're turning this um, insulated, adacarmide is an insulator, so they're turning this now into a material that you can manipulate with electric currents. So um, as, you, as you have this uh, magnetism now in your, in your graphene layer, you can manipulate the spins just by small pulses of electric current. So um, this is quite nice looking at, at future devices, possibly in spintronic uh, materials. So one of the other uh, fields that Fleet is researching is looking at excitons and superfluids. And this um, Sumerian hexaboride sample is quite a nice example of this excitons um, that we're seeing here. Um, in fact, uh, what we see here is that uh, we actually get band inversion. So we get a crossing between the 5D and 4F um, electron bands. So these are really coupled quite strongly um, and give rise to this, this spin excitation. So um, the spin excitation is actually below the charge gap, um, which indicate this um, inversion. Um, and it's, it's really these, these correlations at the 14 milli electron volts um, that drive the topological insulator phase in, in Sumerian hexaboride. Um, and, and as a consequence, we can expect topologically protected surface states in this material. So here's a nice fleet example, actually looking at um, some recent results that were just accepted um, just a few days ago, worked through David Corty and Jared Cole down at RMIT. Um, and they were looking a little bit at these alumina nanoparticles. In fact, these nanoparticles are actually aluminium in their core, and um, they have a shell of alumina or aluminium oxide. Um, so, in this measurement, they've been able to reveal um, boson peaks in this, uh, uh, from the al alumina shells in these nanoparticles. Um, so, bulk glasses, such as alumina, um, really exhibit vibrational modes at, at, at low energies, and, and these can really um, uh, affect um, the fidelity and um, the, the resistance in, in things like qubits and, and, and high temperature superconductors. Um, so if you've got these um, glasses in these devices, suddenly they have these phonons that are disrupting the signal and, and causing resistance. And so one of the main goals of this work is to try and understand um, exactly how this boson peak has, has formed and what they could do to try and um, reduce these phonon peaks um, in alumina. And so they've, they've coupled these neutron scattering uh, results with this beautiful molecular dynamics uh, modeling, as you can see in the middle there. Um, and they're able to, to show that it's actually the, um, the interfacial scattering um, between the aluminium core and the alumina uh, shell um, actually may re reduce the lifetimes of the phonons in the nanocrystals. Um, and so, you know, by reducing the size effects, um, we can perhaps look at ways of, of reducing this boson peak. Um, and, and improving our, our, our devices. Another suite of instruments uh, that we have at ANSTO is the reflectivity instruments. So we have uh, platypus and spats, which are two neutron reflectometers. Platypus has a horizontal uh, scattering plane geometry, whereas spats is a, a vertical uh, scattering plane geometry. And these are coupled with some X-ray instruments. Um, we have an X-ray reflectometer and an ellipsometer for looking at qualities of, of samples. And also part of this group is our polarization station. Um, now, I mentioned before that, that uh, many of our uh, instruments at ANSTO are actually polarization capable. So we can use this helium-3 system to polarize our, our neutrons to make all of the magnetic spins in our, in our neutrons line up together. And we can, we can use this on many instruments to try and understand more information particularly about um, magnetism in our samples. So what is polarized neutron reflectometry and why is it um, really important for the thin film research? So if we look at um, a thin film, say up in the top left hand corner, um, we can have an, uh, a beam of neutrons incident to this 
that will then scatter from the surface. It will also scatter from interfaces and different layers. And it scatters differently due to the refractive index of these materials. And from these results, we can uh, plot a reflectivity curve, which you can see in the middle there. And this reflectivity curve consists of these, these bumps, if you like, called Kiesig fringes. And these Kiesig fringes can tell us um, about the thickness of our sample. So the more Kiesig fringes you have, the thicker the film is, the less fringes you have, um, the thinner our sample is. And by taking the one-dimensional Fourier transform of this reflectivity curve, we can uh, then plot our scattering length density, or our SLD, which tells us a little bit about um, the composition and um, structure in our uh, material. And so polarized neutrino reflectometry, as you can see by the little blue and red uh, arrows, now looks at um, controlling and manipulating uh, the spin on the, on the neutron. So if we come in with um, up spins and come out with up spins, we have R plus plus scattering, uh, which contains both nuclear scattering plus uh, magnetic scattering. And, but if we come in with down and come out with down, we then have R minus minus, which is um, nuclear minus uh, magnetic scattering. So you can see in the scattering length density, um, this results in a, um, an offset between our R plus plus and our R minus minus. Um, and from this, we can, we can get information such as um, the direction of our um, magnetic moments. Um, we can see, you know, most of this information from, from this technique. So it's quite a powerful technique, especially for viewing thin film samples. So this is quite a nice example that was published in Nature not long ago, and it's some um, coupling of a ferromagnetic insulator, uh, europium sulfide, um, with a topological insulator, bismuth selenide. So coupling these two layers, uh, these two layers, um, they've been able to show that the magnetism has influenced the bis bismuth selenide layers, so that we get a sort of a lock-in of the spin momentum. Um, so from the from the polarized reflectometry, the PNR, you can see here we've got um, an offset between your R plus plus and R minus minus um, due to the different length scales as well. And from here, we can move on to have a look at the, the scattering length density and the magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment can be taken from the difference between the R plus plus and the R minus minus um, uh, reflection signals. And you can see that even up to 300 Kelvin, there's still a magnetic moment present in the sample. This is this little green uh, region you can see right down below. Now, um, what this is highlighting is that, you know, even though europium sulfur by itself has an ordering temperature of 17, by coupling these two layers together, we get this really strong spin orbit coupling, which locks in this magnetism up to 300 Kelvin. And in fact, um, this is a really neat example of a magnetic topological insulator because what we see is that um, we, we get this layer in between um, of about two nanometers, so a really thin layer where we get this strong spin orbit coupling and, and magnetic moments that are tilted from the, from the ferromagnetic uh, European sulfur. Um, so this is some really neat, neat work showing how that we can manipulate um, by coupling two different layered materials together. Here's some more uh, fleet research, actually. Um, this is uh, just very recent data collected from Platypus, and it's in collaboration with both David Cordy and Simon Granville from um, the McDermott Institute in New Zealand. So thanks to them for sharing this data with us. Um, what you can see here um, is some beautiful uh, PNR at, uh, of this uh, Heusler alloy, uh, manganese cobalt aluminium, um, at 10 Kelvin. And remember I said that the, the number of Kiesig fringes can tell you a little bit about the thickness of the sample. You can see we've only got really one bump in the R plus and the R minus signals. Um, taking fits to this, I've been able to show that um, the depth of this magne uh, manganese cobalt aluminium thin film is only about one nanometer. So um, PNR is really sensitive to very, very thin layers. Um, what we're also able to show is that um, the manganese cobalt aluminium layer is coupled to the palladium so that uh, there becomes an interface between the two materials and our non-magnetic palladium starts to be influenced by the magnetism um, in the, the, the Heusler alloy below it. So we, we really do get a, a coupling now between, um, between this. So uh, this sort of material actually could be used for spintronic devices. Um, it has a very low saturation magnetization. So um, it's sort of a material that we could use in something like um, spin transfer 
spin transfer torque devices. Um, having a little look at nano device fabrication now, um, this is the final theme of, of the fleet research. Um, this particular uh, result, also from, from Platypus at Ansto, we're looking at hydrogen sensors. So the current sensors that we might use to, to look for hydrogen leaks in our, in our hydrogen powered vehicles um, are quite slow to react at present. Um, but this group has been able to show that using these coupled layers of ferromagnetic cobalt with uh, palladium, non-magnetic palladium, that they could get actually a very rapid um, and very sensitive sensing device. Um, in fact, just by having changing the atmosphere from around 0% uh, hydrogen to around 3%, 3.5% hydrogen, they're able to show significant changes in their layer structures um, from their polarized neutron reflectometry. So particularly look at the plot on the right, we can see that um, the interface layer of the cobalt and palladium, as we start putting hydrogen into the system, you can see that the magnetic moment um, in this, this interface layer cobalt palladium really increases. So we can see a change in the magnetism. We also see a, um, a drop in the scattering length density. So we know that the composition of the palladium layer has changed. It's absorbed hydrogen. And from this, we can work out just how much hydrogen um, has been absorbed into this palladium layer. The other thing that's quite interesting is that the palladium layer actually expands. Um, and so you can see that um, the distance from the substrate, if I can point it out here, um, has now expanded once we've put hydrogen in there. Um, so all of these changes together can really show some quite, um, quite promising uh, sensing results from this sort of uh, configuration. The final example I'd like to show is another fleet um, example. Now, I just got this, this data from uh, Oliver uh, yesterday afternoon, so thanks, Oliver, uh, for sharing this from University of New South Wales. This is part of Nuggie's group. Um, what they're looking at here is bismuth, bismuth iron oxide thin films. Now, this is quite an interesting material because it's got an incommensurate wave vector um, of about 63 nanometers. It's a really long spin cycloid magnetic material. Um, and what they're doing is trying to make thinner and thinner uh, films of this material while maintaining um, long range magnetic order. Um, and they're able to show that if they just grew this um, material standard on a, on a substrate, they, they couldn't achieve this by, but um, by inducing some strain in their substrate, they're able to engineer this material to grow in a slightly different direction such that they could continue having this nice um, uh, incommensurate wave vector uh, in this thin film. Um, one of the reasons I like to point this out is that um, uh, some of these results were taken using Taipan, which is the instrument I'm co-responsible for, um, and typically considered an inelastic instrument. But in this case, uh, we've tuned Taipan to look just for elastic scattering to, to create these beautiful mesh plots that you can see here. So we're getting towards the end of our, our time together. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about how you can access ANSTO and some of the ANSTO facilities that I've mentioned here. So first of all, we have two proposal rounds each year, one in March, one in September, um, where your proposals are uh, peer reviewed and assessed by a program advisory committee. Um, there's no charge for this access. Um, and if you're part of an ANC member organization, then your travel and accommodation costs are reimbursed. The second model is to, to go through a user pays model. Um, typically, this is accessed by our industrial partners um, who don't necessarily wish to publish their results but need the information. Um, cost of instruments can be around $8,000 a day. So um, this is not the typical way that, that scientists tend to access uh, these being facilities. And the third way um, is through a discretionary uh, proposal. So if you've got really high impact science that needs to be done now, um, you could contact our director at ACNS um, and request some, some really high impact um, beam time to be performed at, at, at any time. This is open continuously. So with that, I hope I've been able to uh, describe to you all a little bit about uh, neutron scattering and how they're a powerful tool for um, investigating both structure and dynamics in condensed matter systems, and in particular, uh, fleet uh, type materials. There are different techniques and these are uh, based on different purposes. So you, you really need these different purposes um, to decide which sort of technique you need. Um, 
also showing you that the fleet and low energy electronic materials can benefit from these, these uh, techniques. And uh, ANSTO staff are very happy to talk to you about your science questions. Um, by all means, log on to our website, or come onto our website and, um, and contact us to find out how you can access ANSTO. So before I um, take some questions, I'd just like to say a, a really big thank you to all the people who've helped uh, bring together some of the information in this talk. And just finally, I'd like to pop up a slide to advertise the Australian Neutron Beam Users Group, the ANBUG. Um, it is free to join. So um, if you are interested in neutron scattering within Australia, keeping up to date with what's happening at ANSTO, please join, join ANBUG. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kerry Lee. That was perfect timing. I see some people are clapping in the chat window, which is nice to see. Um, the uh, attendance is great, so it's, it's really fantastic to see so many people online. And we have a few minutes for questions now, which is uh, um, great. Before we go on to questions, I'd just like to personally apologize for that horrible message that was posted in chat. Unfortunately, that's one of the weaknesses of Zoom. Hopefully, they will soon find a better way to control who gets uh, access to that. But I do apologize for that. And well done to Diane for kicking them out straight away. Uh, so on to our first question. Without further ado, um, one of the questions we had uh, concerns the neutron scattering lengths, Carolee from Barnard at Menmona. She says, what does a negative neutron scattering length mean, such as the negative neutron scattering length for manganese? Yeah, okay. So it's just a different way of scattering. Hang on. Uh, maybe if I stop my share and see if I can... Hang on. I'm just trying to find the... Um... find on my PowerPoint uh, where this is. Um, essentially, while I'm finding this uh, PowerPoint presentation slide, um, somehow it's not working, sorry. Um, it's just the potential of how the neutron will interact with the nucleus. So um, it, can, it can interact positively or negatively with the nucleus. Um, and it just tells you how it might scatter from that from that nucleus. Um, I think the um, uh, trying to do this on the fly. I do apologise. This is the one you're talking about. If I can uh, now, I can't share my screen again. Sorry, that probably hasn't explained it terribly well. Um, it's it's just the way that the the neutron will interact. With um with the nucleus, whether it interacts in a positive way, um, it tells you which, sorry, go on. When you're talking about positive and negative, you're talking about phase, right, of the outgoing of the outgoing wave packet. That's right. That's right. And so, in our detectors, we can see the difference between these, um, mm -hmm. and that really can highlight the difference in the in the elements. All right. Thank you. So, another question we had uh, from Lan Wang at RMIT is. What is the smallest size for a nano device that could be studied with with PNR? Yeah, that's excellent. Um, you can see with some of these uh, atomically thin materials that, uh, well, particularly that you, David, have have investigated. Um, you're looking down to the nanometer level. Um, I don't think that they're going to see much better than that. This this data from the manganese uh, cobalt uh, aluminium um, alloy was actually really beautiful data on such a very, very thin uh, sample. That's right. So there's the... So that's probably, Lan, that's probably about the, the limits of what you're going to see. Um, and I imagine you're thinking about your iron, germanium, telluride materials um, here. Um, but certainly, you know, if you've got multi-layers, uh, you can see these interface effects down to this sort of level, one nanometer. Uh, Lang like, would like to clarify, he was also interested in the lateral size, so um, what's a typical size of thin film that would be put into an, a PNR experiment? Yeah, okay, so typical um, lateral sizes are about 10 by 10 millimetres, um, around about one centimetre thin films. Um, the beam uh, on most of the instruments is, is quite large, so you know the beam can be up to 30 millimetre by 30 millimetre squared. Um, but we can, we can use focusing and neutron optics to try and uh, bring the neutron beams down to smaller, smaller sample size to increase the number of, of neutron nuclei in your sample. 
but typical typical substrates and typical um, thin films that we, we look at are on usually on about 10 by 10 uh, millimeter substrates. Okay, um, one more question. I think we're running up against time now, but uh, from Abdullah Kim at University of Wollongong, what is the significance or what information can one get from the differences and the crossing in the spin up and spin down curves in the polarized neutron reflectometry, say on slide 31. I'm glad you put the, the, the page number on. Um, certainly with that, as I mentioned there, the R++ is showing us um, the, the nuclear plus um, the magnetic um, uh, signals, whereas the R minus minus is showing us the nuclear minus uh, the, the magnetic signals. So by taking the difference between these two, um, we can we can determine exactly the magnetic scattering from the samples. Um, I think I think an, another way that we could we could look at um, the magnetism using this polarized neutron reflectometry is to look at spin flip scattering. So look at um, if we have a spin up a neutron coming into our sample. We flip it in the sample and, and measure a spin down coming out. We have spin flip scattering. Um, this can tell us a little bit more about, say, magnetic moments that are oriented uh, within uh, the plane as well. So uh, I have a question of the, um, that maybe concerns. I see there's lots of people online from uh, the Australian neutron user community and who've been affected by the COVID-19 situation. And so that I guess on, on behalf of us, we're wondering, what's, can you give us a bit of an update on what the current situation at ANSTO is concerning site access and, mm. and if we see uh, improvement in the COVID-19 situation, uh, how likely is it that experiments might resume this year, at least for say state users? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And that's, a very dynamic question and the answer is changing daily as we see how the response to COVID is, is progressing. So what I can tell you is that our nuclear uh, reactor is operating even now. So uh, one of the main priorities right now is to produce medical radioisotopes for the Australian community. Now this is um, critical um, right now. So our reactor is still operating through its, its, um, its cycles, which means that potentially our instruments can operate as well. And what we're doing currently is we're um, prioritizing uh, experiments right now that are based on um, improving the COVID situation. In fact, we are running, excuse me, experiments. Um, I think they were running a, an experiment just recently on Dingo, um, looking at, at, at ways to assist with um, understanding COVID and, and um, helping our healthcare workers through this COVID situation. Um, because most of the scientific start staff are based off-site at the moment. Um, we're not running uh, a typical user program at the moment, but since the reactor is operating, um, there is opportunity for um, our instruments to start operating a user program um, as, as things start to get better. Um, I think you're right though, David. I think it's um, likely to be local users um, and instrument development that will, will happen first, um, because I think still there's going to be a lot of um, uh, travel restrictions for interstate travel, so getting our interstate users to come in, um, and particularly international travellers as well. That's going to be very difficult to get the international community here. Um, one thing we are discussing at the moment is looking at um, mail-in samples. So if you have a collaboration with, with somebody at ANSTO, uh, with a, a, someone who operates the instruments, um, perhaps they can run your experiment for you if we're able to operate our instruments um, before the end of the year. So there's a, a number of mechanisms that we're, we're trying to, um, to nut through the details of um, to see how we, can, how we can get back into doing the, the, the great science that we do as soon as possible. Thanks, Kirli. Um, well, we're almost out of time. There's a few more questions uh, which we might uh, discuss offline, I think. But um, uh, thank you again, Kirli, for this fantastic seminar. I just want to mention that um, we will have another seminar next month. Uh, this next month's seminar will be from Equus, uh, which is the Australian Research Center for Excellence in Engineered Quantum Systems. So Equus applies quantum technology to real world practical applications, including material simulators, diagnostic applications, and geosurvey tools. 
and uh, keep an eye on the AIP con uh, communication channels and please spread the word amongst any other physicists who are looking for something to do productive during their uh, lockdown time. And if you have any questions, uh, please fire us an email uh, in the link in your chat and uh, feel free to follow the Anstone Fleet News via Twitter. So thank you again. Thank you.